Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Good morning. Welcome to Radiant Church. If you're wondering who in the world is that guy, you're not alone. My name is Jeff Dixon, and I'm privileged to serve as a missionary in Costa Rica that you all support and make possible for us to be there. So it is such a fun privilege uh, to be here um, with you, to greet you. Greetings from my family who unfortunately could not be here uh, today. Uh, There's my wife, Tracy, our kids, Olivia, Sawyer, and Linnea. It's hard to imagine that Olivia, 17 and a half years ago, was dedicated to the Lord on this very stage. And now she starts college in a month. I'm not any older, but somehow she grew up a little bit. And some things never change because Sean Baldwin still has not worn pants. But (laughs) our family, maybe we could take an offering later to buy Sean some pants. Our our family is doing well. Uh, We'd love to catch you up more on them. Uh, Come find me after the service or this week I'll tell you about an opportunity. I'd like to introduce you and give you a snapshot of what God's doing uh, through you in Costa Rica to my friend Elvis. Uh, Elvis is now 25 or 26 years old. Uh, That's about what he looks like. It's kind of like a glamour shot. We met Elvis about 12 years ago when he was a 14 or 15 year old uh, kid that wasn't in high school at the time. He's a Nicaraguan immigrant in Costa Rica. His paperwork wasn't up to date, so he couldn't study. So he started coming to our wood shop and hanging out. He met Jesus, is learning how to walk with Jesus, much like you and I are learning how to do it. He went back to school. He was able to graduate. Not always easy, not always the right steps, not always a smooth path, not a straight line, much like my path and your path, I would imagine. Uh, But missions and ministry isn't about necessarily reaching a destination. It's about the journey. It's about the process. It's about walking with and accompanying You know, there's many times Elvis has been part of a scholarship program. He actually worked on our staff for about a year. He just finished studying English and recently got a job at an Amazon call center. So who knows when you're calling to complain about your package, maybe he'll pick up on the other line. But, you know, many times over the last decade, people have said, "Ah, I don't know about Elvis. He's just not making the right choices. He's not doing the right things. Maybe we should just weed him out of our programs. But, you know, I have a feeling over the last 40 some years, St. Pete's been up there talking to Jesus saying, "Ah, I just don't know about Jeff. Maybe we should kind of weed him out of our programs. He's not making the right choices. He's not making doing the right things. But, you know, it's about being with people, you know, and it's easy to think that we're doing some great thing because we're privileged to live in San Jose, Costa Rica, where it's 75 degrees right now and not freezing like it is here. But, you know, we're just doing what you guys do. Monday morning, we get up, we go to work, and we share Jesus with people. So I want to encourage you today. You know, we're going to praise Jesus together. We're going to hear from the word. We're going to be launched out into a week of ministry where we're privileged to be ambassadors for Jesus. So I would love to connect with some old friends who are maybe old or just friends that I've known for a long time. Uh, just come find me after the service. I'd love to connect. And also this week on Tuesday night, we're going to have missions night at the Linvalls. I think it's 630, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, love to have you. Please come and hear more stories about what Jesus is doing through you and through us in Costa Rica. So as we move into worship this morning, I would like to read a passage of scripture that shares my heart towards Radiant, but also God's heart towards us. It's from Philippians 1. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. My God. Whenever I pray, I make requests for all of you with joy. For you have been my partners 
in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Hey, would you extend a hand to Tiffany this morning? She's going to be teaching us, and um, she is just a a tremendous gift to our church body, and I know what she's going to bring is going to be a a blessing today. So let's pray for her. Lord, we just thank you for uh, for Tiffany and and the gift that she is. And Lord, we just thank you for um, just the word that the Holy Spirit's put on her heart. And God, we just ask for... um, for your word to go forth and to be clear, and uh, we just thank you. We thank you for her life. We thank you for this morning in your name. Amen. We all stand with me to, for the reading of God's word. Reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Is located on page 811 of the Bible that is in front of you. Um, and if you uh, don't have a Bible and would like to uh, take one home with you. Uh, this this is the exact Bible <laughs> that is uh, in front of the underneath the seats for, and you're welcome to have one. Uh, Jesus is speaking here, so this entire passage is a quote from him in red in the red letter Bibles. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You may be seated. Such a good passage. And uh, we're we're closing out now. This is our third week on money and possessions. We're finishing out Matthew 6. And uh, when Trav came to me and asked me to speak on this passage specifically, it was for a reason. And that reason is that this is an area for me. (laughs) I have some experience in this area. And out of the two of us, I'm the one in the relationship that can worry easily. And I'm also the one that pays the bills in our life. (laughs) But this truly is um, an area for me, an area that I've wrestled to believe God, Um, an area that I have uh, fallen down and got back up again (laughs) in many times, Um, an area where I am, um, I have am and will continue to fight to take ground and to believe God. And um, yeah, I just, I feel, I feel honored to be able to share um, some of my story and to just sink deep into this passage this week as a family of God, to contend for freedom from anxiety to contend for living as children that are loved and well cared for, to contend to be the people of God, the radiant bride that the world looks at and goes, how come they're not worried? Like we have something in God that the world needs. And it's supposed to be evidenced and expressed in this area of our lives. So let's jump in. We start with 
this command from Jesus, do not be anxious. He's contending for a life for us of no anxiety. The kind of life we all want, if we're honest. I don't think anyone's like, yeah, I'm good with my anxiety. I like it. Jesus is saying, don't do this. This is what I want for you. This is what I have for you. And he's talking about necessary things of life in this passage, food and clothing. He's not talking about a mansion or a Rolls Royce. He's talking about the daily necessities of life. And he's talking to a group of disciples who really he's not talking to the most impoverished of the world. He's talking to his disciples who have access to food and clothes. And he's saying to them, I don't want you caught up in these things. I don't want you spinning out here. I don't want you getting stuck. I want you free in this area. So how does Jesus expect us to pull this off? Because we can easily look around and see a lot of things that give cause for anxiety. Even in the United States of America, as some of the richest people in the world, we can look around our daily life and go, well, I have cause. And if we look at this in kind of a broad sweep over, Jesus is saying, he's telling us what not to do. Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we wear? Don't be anxious about tomorrow. But then he also tells us what to do. So the broad remedy is seek first the kingdom of God. And I love this mention of the kingdom. There is a kingdom. There is a king. And this king is not a king who wields power or control by keeping his people in fear. That's not the kind of king he is. He's a king that elicits allegiance because he's trustworthy and good. And so there's this reminder of the kingdom of God. So as we look at the necessities of life, as we look at our life, as we look at our food, our clothes, our spouse, our home, our car, our bills, like the necessity of life, he's saying, bring the kingdom of God over. Bring Jesus's kingship over these areas of life. Trust the good king, not the one who's keeping you cowering in fear. The one who is a good provider, the one who is for you, the one who wants to see you living free and light and easy. Remember his kingship. Bring it over the things that you're concerned about. If we believe in his kingship and we remind ourselves of his kingship, It will dispel our anxiety. So Jesus gives us eight reasons not to worry in this passage. I love it. This passage is power packed. Eight reasons to not worry. And the first reason is life is about something greater. Life is about something greater than food and clothes. Don't be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink. Or about your body, what you shall put on. Why? Because life is more than food and the body is more than clothing. Why do we tend to get anxious about food and clothes? I think there's three things that we can lose if we don't have food or clothes. And the first is pleasure, earthly pleasure. Food and clothes give us earthly pleasure. The second thing that we can gain is human praise or admiration. Those little compliments, those little ways that we feel like we have value or we have worth because we have A, B, or C. We can lose that. And we can possibly lose our life if we don't have food at all or if we're not protected from the cold. So the reasons we can get anxious about food and clothing is because we don't want to lose physical pleasure. We don't want to lose human praise. And we don't want to lose life. And to this fear, Jesus responds, if you're gripped with anxiety over these things, then you've lost sight of the greatness of life. And we do. We have this longing for life. Like we have this ache in us for the good life. And oftentimes we can go to things, to stuff, trying to satiate that hunger for real life. And food and clothing don't, they can't touch it. They don't do the job. 
So life is not given primarily for physical pleasure, but for something greater, enjoyment with God. So we're looking at earthly pleasures versus enjoyment with God. And I just think back to the garden, Adam and Eve walking in the good of the presence of God, cared for and naked and totally happy. (laughs) And we still have that Eden heart in us. We still have that longing to be cared for and and naked and free in intimate walking relationship with God. That is where the good life is found. That is where like the life that we ache and long for, that place of vitality and joy and peace and hope that lasts is found in knowing God and enjoying God. So we see this thing of physical pleasure versus true life that's found in enjoyment with God. And the pleasure we get from food and clothes is fleeting. It passes through us just like the food does. That's how long it lasts. I can't remember a time that like a week later after an enjoying a really amazing meal or buying a new shirt that I was still like living on the life that came from that thing. Like, I just am feeling so much joy and hope and vitality from that meal that I ate. No, it can't do that. It can't do it. And life is not given primarily for the approval of man, but for something greater, the approval of God. We need approval. We need the well done. We need the blessed favor. And we can go to these things to try to get it in places that can't satisfy. We're living for something greater, the approval and favor that comes from God. And life was not given primarily for extension on this earth, but for something greater, eternal life with God in the age to come. Life that lasts, life that doesn't corrode, life that doesn't corrupt, life that doesn't change like the good life that goes on forever and ever. This is what we are made for. This is what we ache and we long for. And food and clothing can do that for us. And so we shouldn't be anxious about food and clothing because it cannot provide the great things of life, the enjoyment of God, the approval of God, and eternal lasting joy in God's presence. I've like felt this particular ache even in the last month. I feel like walking through Christmas, I was just noticing in my heart this ache or longing for heaven, <laughs> for Eden. When, when Trav um, taught the first week on money about like what the moth and the thief and time corrodes, I was like, yes. I like, I was putting these aches and longings on Christmas. <laughs> I was putting these aches and longings on things that can't bear up under the weight of this hope in my heart. This is a longing for eternity that only God can touch and meet. We take Eden hopes and longings and we put them on temporal things and mortal bodies and we live perpetually disappointed. It's like, well, that didn't do it. (laughs) Well, that was kind of underwhelming. (laughs) but we're kind of caught in the trap. And so then we do it again. We go again, we double down and then we're double disappointed. And God wants us out of this trap. He doesn't want us living in this cycle. He wants us living in a different way than the world around us. And we can live unaware of this ache. I felt like over Christmas time, I was getting in touch with this ache in me. Like, oh yeah, this is what this is. But we can live completely oblivious to it. And just stuck in the trap and just going again, trying again, reaching again, reaching again, reaching again for that thing, for that thing, for that thing, for that moment that's disappointing, 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 (laughs) disappointing. There's an ache and a longing in our hearts for what only God in eternity can provide. The kingdom of this world is selling us perishables that corrode, they don't satisfy. They're passing away, they're not lasting. But they do a good job, don't they? 
of selling us on it and advertising to us. Like the, the message that we are hounded with by the world is you need more than you have. 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 And the only thing that will make you happy, 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 happy is if you can get more than you have. Like, literally, there is warfare set against our lives to get us to believe this. Just in general, this is the air we breathe and the culture we live in. Material things are our God. And then we're also up against personal warfare. Like there's lies the enemy uses against us that work. And he keeps using them because they work. I'm becoming familiar with these lies in my own life. Like I can hear them now and I'm like, oh, there you are again trying to do that thing to me that you do. And you're trying to do it because it's worked for a lot of years. Like he knows if you could just send a certain kind of bill to me in the mail, it'll bring me to my knees in a moment. He knows that when he whispers in my ear, you know what would fix all your problems? More money. I go, mm-hmm, you're right. That's true. And sometimes I even repeat it out loud of my mouth. <laughs> he knows that when he whispers in my ear, you would have more and a better life if you hadn't chosen ministry. That that's worked a lot of times. That's a lie that's worked on me. And even now, as I say it out loud, it's like, (laughs) that is so dumb. That is not true in any way. It's a total lie. It's a joke. But see, we all have our tailor-made ways that the enemy keeps us in this trap, keeps our eyes fixed on the wrong things, keeps us stuck. And, I've, and Jesus is wanting us to be free. He's, he is carving a path for us to walk into greater freedom. If I could just get my hands on, does anyone else feel that in their heart sometimes? If I could just get my hands on dot, dot, dot. And then maybe I get my hands on dot, dot, dot. And then tomorrow it turns into, if I could just get my hands on dot, dot, dot. It's a moving target. It's never satisfied. It doesn't produce life. (laughs) Food and clothing are perishables, susceptible to corrosion. It's like worrying about and putting hope in a cucumber and then being shocked when it spoils. <laughs> I don't know why a cucumber came to my mind this week, but she's just like, these are, these are cucumbers. It's all cucumbers. And then when it rots, I'm like, why did it rot? What on earth? It's a cucumber. These things are spoiling. And if we're caught in this trap, then we have to move on to the next spoiling, disappointing thing looking to things to save us from our spoiling. I can talk about this because I know this. I do this. I've done this. We moved into a new house a few years ago to try to save ourselves from the spoiling. I was like, I don't want to live in a house that's corroding. I want to live in a new house where nothing is corroding. And guess what? Three years later, it's corroding. I had a broken kitchen faucet in my old house. Guess what I'm dealing with every day? A broken kitchen faucet. Because it spoils. It's all spoiling. And I can't put my longing for eternity heart onto a kitchen faucet or a cucumber. I have to aim higher than that. Oh, yeah, over Christmas, I asked my parents for a ring made of real gold and these five little white sapphires for my five daughters. The company was selling it as family gold, heirloom jewelry. I was like, I could pass this down to one of my girls one day. And the third time I wore it, one of the stones fell out on the floor in Walmart somewhere. And it's like, oh, Yeah, I was like longing for an heirloom. 
It's all spoiling. I thought, I want to teach this passage at the dump. <laughs> Wouldn't that be just the best setting? Like if we could just all gather around the city dump and be like, let's talk about food and clothes and all the energy and thought and time we spend worrying about these things that become trash like tomorrow. Let's just stare at this dump full of spoiled food and yesterday's shirts and become disenchanted with being duped by the gospel of this world that tells us we need more in order to be happy. Let's just, let's just drive to the dump together and just be sobered by this picture of just a pile of worthless things that people spent so much time and energy trying to acquire and get free. What if the accumulation of all of the activity and energy and work and stress of our lives ends up being a huge dump of corroded things that we thought we really needed? And that's what we have to show for ourselves. <laughs> and in contrast, what is a life of accumulated storing up treasure in heaven look like? I think God wants to recapture our imagination for an accumulated lifetime of heavenly treasure. These are empty pursuits. And this drive inside of us, if I could just get my hands on, if you could just get your hands on the kingdom of God, the only thing that will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's the only thing we can get our hands on that won't break, that won't wear out, that won't rot, that won't end up at the dump. Let's pursue and think about and obsess over the only thing untouched by decay. Our life forever with God. So, Jesus' first reason to not worry is that life is about something greater than what we have. His second reason is, it's God who feeds. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And I just want to ask the question, who feeds you? Who feeds you? Like really get honest in your heart about where you go to be fed. Who feeds you? Who's your source? Where is it coming from? Birds aren't lazy. They're busy all day finding worms and building nests, but they don't feed themselves. It's God who feeds them. And they just eat what they need, not anxious, not hoarding things, just trusting and believing that God's going to do it again tomorrow. He's going to do it again. He's going to do it again. He's going to do it again. And so we should go about our work as if God will feed us again tomorrow. And this last week, we had a, a potential need come up that Trav and I were talking about. And I was getting worried about it like I do. <laughs> he just quickly reminded me, like, hey, we've asked God for this before, and he's given it to us before. We could do it again. And I felt like what God exposed in my heart is um, that I was relating to it like a handout. Like, I've, I've already received a handout from God. Like, I've already asked for that and received a handout from God. And so I can't ask for that again. Which is not, it's not child language, right? Birds don't think that they're getting like a, a handout from God because they're so broken and needy, they need a handout. They're just getting daily food. And it's his joy to feed and provide for them, and it's his joy to feed and provide for us. And he's created a world in which 
We are all dependent, not just the birds. It's God who sends the rain. It's God that provides our need. No matter what your job is, if you have more than you need or less than you need, it's God who feeds you. He sends the rain to water the earth. Don't miss out on this. You can miss out on this if you're rich. You can miss out on this if you're poor. There's different stumbling blocks on both sides. Jesus is wanting us to live here, knowing that no matter how much we have, if it's more or less than what we need, that it's God who feeds us. That it's God who takes joy and delight to care for us and to see us depend on him for what we need. Jesus' third reason to not worry is that worry, worry is a bad investment. It's an investment that yields zero returns. Negative returns, if you ask me. It can't add a single thing to your life. He says it can't even add an hour to your life. It produces nothing. Worry is a waste. And in contrast, asking God for what we need is the most fruitful investment that we can make. How many of us, like a child, honestly and vulnerably ask God for what we need? I have to be honest, this is still not my default. This is still not quickly and easily the first place that I go in response to need coming up in my life. In fact, um, this week, you know, I'm preparing to teach on, like, don't worry about your life. (laughs) And had some things happen that were making me worry about my life. We found out that we need some really expensive tutoring for one of our kids. And then that same day, Trav came home with a huge medical bill. And we went for a walk. And inside, I was doing the churn, the churn thing. And instead of being able to recognize, like, oh, this feels like a lot. And maybe I need to bring this before God and ask him to help me. I was, like, already down the road fixing the problem myself. So I'm starting to spin in like, okay, like, I mean, honestly, in reflecting on that conversation, I was like, I feed me. The evidence shows that I believe that I feed me because as the bills came, it was like, all right, what am I going to do? What kind of side hustle am I going to do? And the conversation, it was a little bumpy with us. He was shooting down my ideas. I was getting mad. Then we were like, meh. And then the next day, he was like, I don't know what that was about. And I was like, it was about me feeling like this is really hard and overwhelming. And he was like, well, you could have said that. (laughs) And I just feel like this is what we do. Like, instead of going to God, like, honestly, vulnerably in our hearts, going, this is really hard and overwhelming. And I don't know what to do about this, God. Will you help me? We go, I feed me, I feed me, side hustle, side hustle, or whatever. However, I'm going to fix the problem myself, which is very anxiety producing, which is not the way Jesus is inviting us to live. Fourth reason Jesus says to not worry is that God loves to adorn And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so loves to clothe the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? I feel like the birds are singing to us. Father, you are all we need. I feel like the flowers are singing to us. It is well. Jesus can almost sound like a prosperity preacher here. Birds get just enough, but lilies get a little bit more. They're dressed better than Solomon. But I feel like what Jesus is saying here is that God's heart's not fully communicated through the birds because he's much more extravagant than that, and he'll do more than just barely enough for you. And I could testify to this from my life. So many, so many moments that God abundantly and generously provided more than I ever needed. 
God loves to make grass beautiful. How much more will he make you beautiful? And I feel like what we learn from the flowers is that they flourish in God by enjoying what God provides. That's what makes them beautiful. They need nothing more than the care of God. They don't say, maybe if I was planted over there, or maybe if I was dressed more like that flower, then I could be happy. And I just feel like the invitation for us this morning is to flourish in God right here and right now. God, I choose flourishing over a life of accumulation. I choose my life over the life of someone else. You can plant me where you want. You can water me how you see good and fit. My life is in your hands, and I want to flourish in you right here and right now more than I want anything else. There is an adorning that only comes from God a beauty that only comes from God, a way of having our nakedness covered that only comes from God that no clothes can ever touch. These two illustrations are natural theology. We can step outside and look at creation and we can see God's providence at work. We waste many hours Um, in the time and day that we live, not saturated in natural theology, not looking around the way that God is providentially caring for what he has made, but staring at screens that inundate us with ads telling us that we need more than what we have. And look how this person is adorned, and maybe I should be adorned like this, and we're being fed lies, and it's, expe- it's affected the story that we are believing about God and about ourselves and the way that we live, the way that we see and experience our life. I could be the poorest person that I know, or I could be the richest person that I know, depending on what I look at today. So what story or narrative are you living in and believing What are you being fed by? Maybe bird watching and flower enjoying is way more profound and spiritual than it ever has been before. Jesus says, you're worth more than these. So fight the good fight. I just want to say unfollow people, even Christians who are leading you to want mere things. In January, I fasted social media and I fasted. I took everything off of my phone that had to do with buying anything. Just get it out of my life. I don't need to see this anymore. Because I think we can come into Christmas and we start spending more than we usually do. And it has like a snowballing effect. Has anyone ever experienced this? Now all of a sudden I'm used to buying, I'm buying, I'm buying. And the buying needs to stop. And so we can fast. We can memorize this passage. We can watch birds and flowers and get out in creation. We can saturate ourselves in the word of God and get the right narrative before our heart and mind so that we can live free of anxiety and really fight worry in a way that's effective. This is how we live as cared for children of God. Jesus' fifth reason is that unbelievers seek these things. People who don't know God aim at this stuff. This is their pursuit because they don't believe that they have someone backing them up. And if we sound like the world, then it shows that we're very much like the world and what makes us happy. And when we worry, we're advertising that God doesn't know our needs and he's not going to care for them. Jesus assumes that we won't be like that, that we won't want to be duped, that we'll want to live a different kind of life. And like I said, what a testimony it is to the watching world when the church is not worried because the church knows that it's backed up and cared for by a good king. The seventh reason to not worry is that there are kingdom bennies. (laughs) Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Aim at the right thing. Trav talked about this week. Don't aim at the wrong thing. 
All these things, God gets to decide what all these things are. He decides our portion and what we need. We go to work for him. If you go to work for him, he goes to work for you. You care about what he cares about, he's going to see to it that you're cared for. Like our son or daughter taking over the family business. There's some benefits that comes with that. There's some bennies. Anyone like bennies? I do. The best bennies you could ever find better than anything the world could ever try and offer you are the bennies that come from seeking first the kingdom of God and not worrying about the other stuff. And lastly, the eighth reason to not worry is that today is all you've really got. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. God's appointed each day with its own portion of pleasure and pain. And worry is a liar and it lies about tomorrow, and it tries to pull tomorrow's pain into today. It tries to compound itself. And so we go from worrying about that bill to worrying about the, all the braces to worrying about all the weddings to worrying about will we ever get to retire? Like that's what worry does. It compounds on itself, and it, it reaches out and grasps for tomorrow's burden next weeks, next years, next decades, and it's trying to lasso it into today without tomorrow's pleasure, without tomorrow's provision, without tomorrow's grace, just the yucky stuff. And then we let it in the door and we entertain it and we think, why am I so bound by anxiety? So don't welcome it, don't let it in the door. Jesus is saying, stay here today, stay here and today where my portion for you is what I'm giving you grace to walk in. Don't let worry do that. Don't let future troubles into today. Don't open the door to them. Don't welcome them. It's one step at a time and no more. Today's grace, today's provision. God will be God tomorrow. His presence will be there tomorrow. He'll be with you. So don't be anxious. The world's telling you, you feed you and you need more than what you have. Jesus is telling you, God feeds you. He delights to adorn you. And there's more than enough for what you need. Come away from the world's ways. If there's any lies you've believed, let's repent this morning and get clean. I've been doing it all week. So you can just come up here and join me. Let's repent of the ways that we've been duped, the subtle ways that we've started to entertain the world systems and what it tells us we need for life. Let's get clean of that again this morning. Let's vulnerably and honestly, like a loved and cared for child, that is who we are, bring our need before God. Tell him about the things that feel overwhelming. Tell him about what is beyond you that you can't ha handle. Ask for his help. Ask for him to meet your needs. And I just, there's people that are going to come and they're going to be open for prayer. If you need to tend to any of these things, that's what we're here to do this morning as a family. And then we're going to come to the table this morning. This table that where we get fed by Jesus' own body and blood. Like God cared so much about feeding us that he gave his precious son. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God's not going to stop short. He's not going to go all the way into giving us his son and then stop short. That's not what he's up to. That's not what he's about. So come to the table this morning and literally act out God feeding you, God providing for your spiritual, eternal, emotional, mental, and physical need. God going to great lengths to provide everything that was needed for us to have the life that we long for. Jesus, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for providing life that's greater than 
these things. Thank you for feeding us and clothing us. Thank you for giving us the most precious thing that you could give us and making a way for us to come into full, abundant, beautiful, satisfying life right now, right here, right now. Cause us to flourish in you, God, to delight in your care over our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life And I, I'm a pilgrim here on the side of the grave Divide